Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a part of the program that you've signed up for. We know that it has been some time, so we wanted to take the time to explain to you what has been occurring. The law requires individuals such as ourselves and other parties to give notification that there is an outstanding issue because the other party must have an opportunity to correct or rectify the problem. This is a fundamental due process requirement. You can find this at Mullane versus Hoover Trust and Bank Company. This particular case, the Supreme Court made it quite clear, and as they've done in several other cases since then, that it is a fundamental due process requirement that a party be giving notice before having a substantial due process right taken from them. We've sent out communications on your behalf to your individual creditors. None of them have provided the information being requested. Because many of you have a contract that was introduced between yourself and the Aeon Foundation as opposed to AmeriLegion, AMCF, and or the DAP program, an arbitration hearing was had at the request of the Aeon Foundation who was a party to the agreement. The arbitrator reached a decision based upon either non-participation, non-communication, and or failure to provide evidence necessary to sustain any opposition to violation of the contractual agreement. We are in the process of helping you offset this on your 1099-Cs. For the rest of you, many letters have gone out to separate creditors asking for certain information which the law requires. You will be receiving, or if you have not already received, a packet with each of the letters that were sent out on your behalf. Accompanying this video is a communication. The communication is for this document right here. This document deals with filing in small claims court. Now I know many of you are leery of small claims court. Please, you shouldn't be. Small claims court is how I got my start. At the age of 16, I studied small claims rules. There are basic rules for small claims court. These are not the same rules as the regular court. Small claims court rules are written for the layman to understand. In other words, none of you should have a problem understanding the rules of small claims court. Do not be intimidated because it says the word rules. If I can do it at the age of 16, all of you can do it at the age of 108. Just kidding. So it is a suggestion that you go over the rules for small claims court in your area because you're about to get yourself involved in a career of going into small claims court. And let me explain why. And this goes for everyone receiving this communication who's a member of one of the programs. We have more coming for you, but we need to explain before we go on and talk about how this document is to be processed. For some of you, you've thought that it took a long time. This has been, oh, it's been tedious. What you don't understand is how tedious it really has been. We have spent over $7,000 in mailings. Now, if you don't believe... Go ahead and take a look at the packet many of you received. There are more than 29 documents in there that were mailed separately to individual creditors. See, when you mail out a document notifying someone that there's a problem, then they have a certain amount of days to respond, and we had to give them that. One moment. One of the primary and first things you must understand is why. Why use small claims court? Well, for lack of a better word, small claims court was designed for people like you. People who didn't know much about law, didn't know much about codes, didn't know much about procedures of the court. Small claims court was designed because they had to make a way for the common person to go into court and state their claim. Now, although you see shows like uh, People's Court, Judge Judy, Judge Joe Brown, the divorce court, you see all of those mimicking small claims court. 
Small Claims Court is your Justice of the Peace Court. It's the very same court that you go into if they're foreclosing on your property. Now, technically, when they're foreclosing on your property, the one thing they don't allow you to do is a counterclaim. Anyone can do a counterclaim against you in Small Claims Court. But the parties that you're going to be going after, they don't have a claim. See, you're going after bonds. What do we mean by bonds? Well, all major companies, especially financial companies like banks, must be bonded and insured. They must have a license. If they have a license, they are usually required to be bonded. Just in case they harm one of the people in this country or the posterity of the people. Now, this document explains that you are one of the posterity. You don't have to be a citizen to be one of the posterity. All you have to be is in America because it was provided for the framers, which the preamble says the framers were the people. And they said they ordained it and established for themselves and their posterity. Nobody can argue whether or not you're one of the posterity because they have no way of proving you're not. You don't have to prove that you are. They have to prove that you're not. The first thing you do in the court is you challenge the jurisdiction. You must challenge the jurisdiction of the court right off the bat. So you're going to put your name at the top. Then you're going to put the name of the court. You're going to call it a court of record because that's what it's supposed to be. That's what you're demanding. If they do anything else other than that, you'll find out that you can actually go after the judge's bond. If there was a judge who violated your rights, if there was a prosecutor who violated your rights, if there was a clerk of the court who violated your rights, create yourself a ski, ski fee schedule. Document the violation of rights and take on the small claims court. Now, the fee schedule is not what you're introducing in the small claims court. That's what you're going to do for the tax credits associated with filling out the 1099-C. If you don't know about a 1099-C, there are tons of videos on the internet showing you what a 1099-C is, including videos done by Eon. That's what the suggestion would be. Okay? That is what the suggestion would be. That you watch those to figure out what a 1099-C is useful for. Now, the law, again, requires you to give notification. You are giving notification. You are going to bring a suit against those one through unlimited, and then you're going to add the name of the bank in front of your doe. So if it's Wells Fargo Bank, you're going to put, wake up, Wells Fargo Bank, comma, N-A, comma, et al., Stop listening. Now, I did something different that I should not have done. When you do this section, whenever you're naming a defendant, you want to do the upper lowercase. Yours, your name, I mean, you're all uppercase. Your name is upper lowercase. The name of your estate, all capitalized letters. Don't worry about them changing it. Because you've already stated in this, you don't give them permission to have any control over your name. Your name, when it's associated with your information, is your property, not theirs. You have the right to property. You're letting them know that your name and anything associated with it is private property. Just that simple. We'll talk about it in a second. Give it a, give it a moment. I know some of you are asking questions. What do you do? Blah, blah. We're going to get to that. This is a suit at common law. Ladies and gentlemen, the Seventh Amendment says in all suits at common law, you should have the right to a trial by jury. In here, you talk about how a trial by jury and a jury trial are not synonymous. Okay. This suit is brought at common law and acknowledges the public officials have to be insured that you have the right to redress. Then what you're going to do, you don't have to change any of this. This is general information, ladies and gentlemen. Every bit of it is general information. When you get here, this when you start putting in your complaints. Now, remember I told you we sent out 29 different letters? Well, each one of those letters required a response, ladies and gentlemen, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, and the Truth and Lending Act, for those of you who have mortgages, student loans, or car loans. So each one of these sections, you don't need five or six claims. You're going to bring three claims only. Why? 29 letters, three divided into 29, goes in nine times, ladies and gentlemen, with two left over. Three claims per complaint, and the final two, you can bring one more claim after that. So you can bring a total of 10 separate claims because in small claims court, it's not the dollar amount that you're concerned with. You're not suing 
for the total worth of whatever the issue is, the total worth of the property, you're suing for the damage and violation of your right under those acts that I just mentioned. And they have a dollar amount. You want to sue for the maximum amount allowed in that court because you're going to sue the insurance company and the bond for each of these agents. We don't care about the agents. We don't care about their company. We only care about the insurance. So when you're suing the agent, you're suing the agent's insurance company. When you're suing the company, you're suing the company's insurance company. And then you're suing the insurance policy, i.e. the bond. Why are you suing the bond and an insurance policy? Well, first, they're not immune. And they took out insurance. That's called liability insurance. You were bringing a claim. And the reason why you're suing them is because you already asked these people, as we have, for their bond information. And they failed to provide it. And you asked them for other information that, by law, they must provide, and they failed to provide it. So guess what you get to do? Ta-da. Now, you can bring up the issues. So you bring up three violations. So you go through the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, go through the Fair Credit Reporting Act. You bring up three violations, and in the rest, you explain what they did. You don't have to go into full detail, kamikaze, or anything like that. You just explain what they did. Leave the rest of this alone. You don't have to change none of this. You don't have to change none of this. The only thing you have to do is come here, put in your name, because you're letting them know that you're rescinding all of those stupid contracts, that all those little stupid trust agreements, that adhesion contracts, you're, you're not playing that game. And then finally, most people are missing this point. Oh, I'm sorry. I just missed it too. Hold on. We got to go back to that right above this line right here. Right above this line, there is the date. Okay? And there is on the other document, this is the more recent one, on the other document, no, there it is right there. Right here at the bottom of that letter, okay, there is a place for you to sign. Okay? There is a place for you to sign right here at this X. And you're going to sign. Now, this document has changed again, and you got to bring this down just a little bit lower for it to go back to where it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be up there. The commercial business wasn't supposed to be under here. So the document is up correct. This is just because this is a box. When it moves, the system moves with it or doesn't move with it. So this box has that X for you to sign. You must sign it in front of the notary. This has a jurat and an acknowledgement. Notaries are going to insist that you do an acknowledgement. You're going to say no because this is an affidavit. This part is for the affidavit. This part is for the acknowledgement. See, acknowledge, and this one says affidavit. These are two separate things allowed to be here Jurat and acknowledgement. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, and this is just the end note explaining why you have the right and what they, the Supreme Court has decided. Now, we're only going to take about three more minutes to explain this to you, and we're hoping that all of you will be able to get it. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why small claims is your best bet and your best avenue, I have to pause for just one second, is simply because... Small claims court, each of you knew that eventually you would end up in court. Small claims court is a preemptive action. Small claims court is against the president of the corporation. Now, you could also bring a claim when you bring it against the, because you're going to do the bond and you're going to do the insurance company and you're going to name the president of whatever company, it is, if it's the mortgage lender or the servicer, name the president. If you're in a state that does not allow attorneys to come into small claims court, then you're in the best position because now they can't use their attorney. Now that representative will have to come in there. If you have a mortgage, the only thing you're asking for is that they provide proof of funding that you requested or whatever was being requested in the document that they provide the information. That's all you are asking. It doesn't matter whether they say they're not required to, they are required to. You're going to say, well, that's not the question. If they, well, we're not required. You're going to say that's not the question. The question is yes or no. Did you respond? Well, we responded. Did you provide the information? Well, we didn't. Okay, fine. 
did you provide your bond information and the information for the insurance company? Well, we didn't have to do that. Okay, thank you. That's the end of your questioning. You don't have to ask any more questions. Don't worry about what they say. The fact is you need to know that they didn't provide it. Well, guess what? <laughs> we don't need a law that says they need to provide it. We don't need a law that says they don't need to provide it. We don't need proof that they did or didn't provide it. What we need, ladies and gentlemen, is simply to ask them and then to say, did you provide your bond information upon request? Because you were making a claim. You were filing a claim. It's not their decision whether or not to accept your claim or not. It's the insurance company's decision. And because they have a contract with the insurance company, the bonding company, and because they do have insurance, whether it's through risk management or otherwise, you're going to have to read the document because it explains all of this. Because they have a policy with them and the policy requires them to communicate their liability insurance information and they didn't, then that's grounds for you to bring forth this claim because you're only bringing up the fact that they did not provide liability insurance information. Ta-da! That's it. They didn't provide liability insurance information like they were required to. And then, oh, by the way, they didn't provide these other documents either like they were required to. And that pattern right there violates and interferes with my rights. Ladies and gentlemen, this document does a whole lot more. And we'll talk about this subsequent to this in other videos for you, just for your benefit. This is not being put out for the public. This is only being put out for your benefit because you are our clients. So until the next time, thank you. And please review the document. There'll be more instructions to follow. Have a very good day.